All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Ranger Dave, here with Ranger Dan. Uh, Howdy. We're, we're going to be talking about uh, bear safety today and kind of about how we coexist with bears here in Brooks Camp. It's really kind of a special, special situation that we have here. Um, we do a lot of uh, uh, kind of unique things uh, to make sure that we can coexist and, and that uh, the two animals, humans and bears, can tolerate each other's presence and uh, both kind of do our things here. It's a pretty special place. It's not like anywhere else I've ever been in the world. Yeah. Uh, really, the the amount of big brown bears that we have here sets it apart. Uh, and people and bears end up, uh, whether they like it or not, interacting uh, with each other at a pretty close level uh, pretty frequently. Yeah. And so if you're not uh, not quite familiar with the live chat setup, um, we're going to talk about you know the, the subject, bear safety, for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then after that, uh, we'll be answering as many questions as we have time for. Yep. Uh, the live chat will go for about one hour. And uh, so if you have any questions, submit them on the link that we provide in the featured comment or just put them into the comment section uh, on the chat. And, uh, yeah, we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Mm -hmm. um, we're able to do this today because of Explore.org. Uh, Katmai National Park is partnering with Explore. They have webcams all over the world, and several of them are here uh, at Brooks Camp uh, to view, so people can view the bears from all over the world. So you can watch all kinds of cool bear behaviors. You can see sunrises from on top of Mount Dumpling. You can watch uh, uh, beluga whales on the Naknek River Cam. We have an underwater camera where you can watch the salmon migrating upstream. Uh, the connection and the, the cameras up provided by Explorer are pretty amazing. Uh, and if you ever have questions in the future you know, that, we, that we don't get to today, you can always ask uh, those in the comments below the camera, uh, the camera feed there. Yeah, so there's a, a ton of people on there that have been watching for years, and um, they've got a really pretty vast yeah. uh, uh, resource of knowledge. They there can help you chat. out, and we we try and jump on there when we can too, and, and help and answer questions if if we can get to it. Yeah, so maybe we could start by kind of telling people why there's so many bears here. Why is Brooks Camp mm -hmm. such a unique place mm -hmm. uh, as far as animals go? Really, it all comes down to the sockeye salmon. The sockeye salmon are the the main fish that we have here on on the Brooks River, you've you've maybe uh, seen pictures of bears fishing uh, for for fish on the Brooks Falls. Uh, that's probably what we're most famous for it's here. Kind of a classic picture that yeah. you see of Katmai as a, a bear. bear standing on the lip of the falls. Yeah. yeah. Well, those are ocean-going fish. They're born in freshwater. They live most of their lives in in the ocean, and then they return back to the freshwater where they were born to reproduce and then die. And that is a natural cycle that's been going on for millions of years. And those fish, the sockeye salmon, come into this river by the hundreds of thousands. They come into this area by the millions. Mm -hmm. And they bring a tremendous amount of nutrients and energy and calories with them, not just for the bears, but for the entire ecosystem. Even the trees benefit from the energy brought in by these fish. And that that really draws the bears. That's why we got the bears here. Mm -hmm. And the sheer scale of it is just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, we get about 40 million sockeye salmon in Bristol Bay every single year. That's a lot. Um, and then about 300,000, give or take 100,000, uh, will swim through the Brooks River each year. And you know, there's a lot of rivers and streams in Alaska that have sockeye salmon, that have salmon that swim up and uh, spawn in the surrounding areas. Uh, but what's unique about the Brooks River is the falls. Mm -hmm. um, you know, number one, we have a ton of fish that come through, but also they have to stop at the falls as they migrate up the river, and in doing so, creates excellent fishing conditions for the bears. And the bears know this, so they come back each year, and um, they can prey on the fish that, that are stopped temporarily by the falls before they continue on. Because as those fish are migrating up from the ocean, most of the time they're either in a big lake or in a big river where the bears can't get to them very right. easily. So once they come up to that waterfall that we've been talking about, the Brooks Falls there, that's uh, the first time where they're really forced into a smaller body of water where it's shallower and they have to wait behind that waterfall. They have to make a few attempts before they can jump it up, jump up the falls. It's a really the ideal spot for the bears to catch them. Right. And so now because of that, um, we've got a ton of bears. Mm -hmm. In Katmai, as an entire park, we've got about 2,000 bears. But that's spread out over four million acres, so quite a bit of space. In Brooks Camp, uh, last year we counted about 50 individual bears that used the river. Um, in, uh, in accordance to that, we've got quite a few people that come to watch bears as well. It's a really remote place here in Brooks Camp, but it is accessible by float plane, and um, we get about 10,000 people each year 
that come to mainly to c come to watch the Bears. It's really probably the best place in the world to watch Bears. Mm -hmm. And so to manage those people and to uh, accommodate those people, we have about 60 uh, individual humans that uh, live in Brooks Camp over the summer. And so that creates a really interesting situation where we have people visiting and people living with bears. And uh, there's a few things that we do, there's several things that we do in order to allow that to happen safely both for us and for the bears. Because that mm -hmm. is the, the main goal here is to uh, continue this, this coexistence that we have with these really amazing, powerful animals. Yeah, maybe we should take a second and uh, explain kind of what's unique uh, that it, or that it's not you know, as far as uh, the whole continent goes, or as far as the whole country goes, it's not un it's not uh, uh, typical for these bears to to have access to these to these fish right. like this. So, having that brings so many more bears to the area. It allows the bears to grow so much larger, allows them to be more tolerant of each other and of of people. And I think we'll talk about that more as we go along, probably. But but that's really a, an important part when we start thinking about bear behavior, human behavior, you know, the interaction between this, between our two animals here. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of reminds me of a, uh, uh, an important maybe fact that we should cover is there's a difference between a brown bear and a grizzly bear. Oh, right. right? Mm -hmm. And that's born from the sockeye salmon. Yeah, a lot of people ask us about that. What is the difference between a grizzly bear and a brown bear? Well, in a lot of ways, there's not a difference. They're the same species. It's the same right. exact animal. Um, brown bear, all what we like to say, confusingly, <laughs> is that all grizzly bears are brown bears, but not all brown bears are grizzly bears. Really, what makes a brown bear a brown bear is access to coastal resources, right. like sockeye salmon, which is what the bears here have access to. Mm -hmm. So, when our bears here are eating a lot of marine resources, they're eating a lot of salmon, or if they do live on the coast, they're also eating other kinds of marine fish, as well as clams, and they have access to sea otters and things like that. That, those abundant marine resources allow the bears to get way bigger. Right. And that changes their disposition. Mm -hmm. Whereas grizzly bears are what we, what we call interior bears. They don't, they don't have access to those marine resources, so they don't get as big, and they have to, they have to depend more heavily on uh, vegetation and foraging and large mammals. They have to live a little bit of a different life. Right. Uh, it's not as cushy as, <laughs> as, the, as the coastal brown bears. Yeah, the bears here have it pretty good. In mm -hmm. the bear world, they've got it made. Yeah. Um, that's not to say that they're not dangerous. They can't be dangerous. Right. They're absolutely massive creatures with big old teeth and big old claws. They can run 35, 40 miles an hour. So if, if we get ourselves in the wrong situation, if we start... Um, uh, ignoring the things that we need to be paying attention to, they can be just as dangerous as a grizzly bear. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, grizzly bears are a little more defensive. Um, they'll spook a little easier. And um, I think maybe a good way to think about it is that brown bears are a little bit more tolerant of, our, of us watching them, but we shouldn't let that... Uh, shouldn't let ourselves be lured into thinking that brown bears are any safer than right. grizzly bears. Right. But uh, we are definitely better able to uh, sit on the platforms and observe brown bears than we would be grizzly bears uh, in the interior, where uh, those bears will react to humans at much further distances. Interior bears are going to be a lot more skittish around people. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, yeah, it would be a mistake to, to lure ourselves, to, to let ourselves think that they're any safer here. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. So we've got all these brown bears, mm -hmm. and we've got all these people, too. So, you know, there's places in the world like this, but it's, it's pretty rare. It's pretty unique to have a situation where you've actually got people living with this dense of a concentration of brown bears. So there's some things that we need to do um, to allow that to happen successfully, to do it safely for us and mm -hmm. for the bears. Um, n the number one uh, probably thing that, that we do is everybody that comes to Brooks Camp has to go to bear school. Um, everybody gets a, a what we call bear orientation where they're taught about different behaviors that they should use and uh, taught about all the rules that we have here. We do have a lot of rules here. We have a lot of rules. We, and we take them pretty seriously. We ask that the people who visit this place, and the rangers included, we don't get a free pass on this. No one does. <laughs> yeah. um, Even the, the park superintendent, when she arrives for the first time of the season, she gets a bear, bear orientation, yeah, he or she. That's something we could say is that uh, if, you've been, if you're a ranger and you've been coming and working here for five, six years, ten years, it doesn't matter. You still go through a bear orientation right. every, in your first day when you get here. Um, so we ask that the visitors who come here 
and the Rangers, we ask everyone who comes here that they change their way of life, that they alter right. the way that they live, their behavior. Our, as, as humans, we've decided that we should change our behavior here. And that I think we have a question that we were going to start things off with. Right, yep. So this is a question that, uh, not that we're going to answer. This is a, well, I think maybe we'll get to an answer as we go along, but uh, I'd be very much interested in reading the audience's answers to this question. Uh, I'll just get on with it. <laughs> Why should we adapt our behaviors to around wild animals you know why should we alter the way we live for animals aren't we the top the top dog here I thought we were the the, the pinnacle of the food chain you yeah. know do don't we have a right to just do what we want now yeah. if we're at the top of the food chain you know that's me playing devil's advocate a little bit there so as we go along we'll try and read uh, read the answers to that question definitely after uh, David and I are going to be reading through your answers to that so just uh, you know, type in the comments below the video feed there. Let us know why why you think we should we should alter our behavior uh, for it, wild animals. Yeah. Why is it important? Why why yeah. should we? What's, or is what's it important? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so let us know your answer to that, and we're going to be diving through, and we'll be answering your questions as we go along. You can write your questions in the comments as well. Mm -hmm. And you know that goes for here as well as other places. You oh know, yeah. Because this isn't the only place with wild animals. Right. Uh, bears are a special circumstance for sure. Uh, there's a special animal mm -hmm. that requires, you know, maybe some additional sacrifice on our part, some additional adaption of our behavior. But mm -hmm. there's lots of wild animals. Why should we adapt our behavior for any of them? For any of them. Yeah. So we want to hear your answers on that. Type that in on the in the uh, in the text, and we'll uh, we'll see if we can read some answers live, and we'll certainly be reading them once the chat is over. I, I'm hearing someone yelling something about bear and camp right now too. So this is yeah. a good a good uh, example of what we're talking about. Right. We may need to rapidly alter our behavior. <laughs> yeah. And run up here inside onto the porch if a bear comes uh, too close to us. Yeah. So just so you know that so might be happening. So if we quickly walk towards the camera <laughs> and disappear from view, there's probably a bear around, and mm -hmm. if it's safe too, we'll point the camera at it. If not. We'll bring the camera you inside. You might be on and, your own. Yeah. <laughs> and that'll be that. <laughs> so, you know, that brings us to the point of, you know, we do adapt our behavior quite a bit here. Mm -hmm. And we make some sacrifices living here. They're mm -hmm. not, you know, we're not going through torture necessarily. No, I don't it's, think so. It's all very much doable things mm -hmm. that we adapt, that we do. But, you know, nonetheless, they are sacrifices. Mm -hmm. Or alterations at any rate. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So let's, so let's dive into it, yeah. Yeah, so one of those things, like I said before, is the uh, uh, that bear orientation, that everybody who comes here... Sorry, looks like there's a bear. <laughs> not, not quite in our presence yet. So we don't we'll, see it, but we we'll see... We'll keep going yeah. until uh, we have to stop. So, right, bear orientation. Everybody okay. who comes here spends 20 to 30 minutes... Um, getting a lecture by a ranger and uh, watching a short video, getting some information on kind of the rules of the land, what what the do's and don'ts are, and we'll kind of go over some of those do's and don'ts right now. Yeah. So the first the first thing that you'll learn about in the film is in the in the bear safety film, and then the the ranger will, uh, goes over this as well. Fifty yards, magic magic number. Yeah. Um, so everybody needs to stay fifty yards away from bear. You cannot approach a bear within 50 yards and that kind of magic number 50 was determined uh, through some studies at, at McNeil Falls. Mm -hmm. um, some researchers uh, gathered that uh, the bears there, which are very similar to the bears here, both coastal brown bears, um, they started overtly reacting to other bears at about 50 yards. So from that information, the, so they the Brooks Camp Management number. figured, okay, 50 yards seems to be when they start mm -hmm. reacting, making some uh, showing some stress or uh, maybe deciding is this something I need to deal with, is this something I can walk away from. So that's where that 50 yard number comes from. Yeah, We can say that's a little bit unique. Uh, yep. be, not everywhere has a 50 yard rule. Uh, in some places the rule is 100 yards or more. Uh, in other national parks in Alaska or in just other areas uh, in the lower 48 around grizzly bears or around brown bears. But here, the rule is 50 yards, yeah. and that's where the rule comes from. And it would be great to uh, have like a something 50 yards away from us that we could then say, okay, so that's 50 yards. The mm -hmm. problem is, when you're on camera with these telephoto lenses, it's it's very much... Uh, it's uh, difficult. Yeah, it it doesn't quite show up the way you want it to. You can have something 50 yards that looks... 
20 yards away. And it, it so you, you have to be careful when you're watching uh, uh, on the cams. You might think, well, that person is way too close to a bear. And it, there's a chance that there might be somebody close, too mm -hmm. close to a bear. That certainly has happened in the past, and it does happen. But um, just kind of a uh, something a thing to keep to in remember, mind. Yeah. yeah, is that the cameras can distort things. Yeah. For the most part, everyone out here uh, stays stays 50 yards from bears pretty much all the time. People follow the rules pretty well. Mm -hmm. Most people are not too eager to to jump inside 50 yards <laughs> with one of these brown most bears. Most people, yeah. Once you get a look at the bears, uh, they they can intimidate intimidate you out of 50 yards pretty right. easily. Right. So the second thing that people learn in their bear orientation, and this is really the the one the behavior altering one. It's pretty easy to keep people 50 <laughs> yards from bears. Yeah. This is a little bit harder. The tough part is. Anywhere you go in Brooks Camp, um, you cannot have food with you, and you cannot leave unattended gear outside of an arm's reach. Mm -hmm. um, so can I have a candy bar right now? No, you cannot. Oh. You cannot have a candy bar. You cannot have a cup of tea. You can't carry your coffee around and consume it. Um, so it's difficult for everybody, um, even rangers, who are, are going to live here for the whole summer. For the, the Maybe first especially. You have a cup of coffee. You say, I'll oh, just step outside. Yep. Nope. Nope. Can't drink your coffee nope. outside. Nope can't consume any food product outside. Right. Mints, gum, that counts. We don't yep. allow it outside. Yep. Um, and it's, it's because we don't want bears to ever associate humans with a food reward. Right. We don't want bears looking for human food. It goes downhill very quickly once that becomes uh, an association in the bears' minds. Yeah, so that we keep that rule really strict if we ever see somebody with a food item of any kind, whether they're chewing gum or drinking just an innocent cup of tea, mm -hmm. um, even, if so, even if it's something you would think that, you know, bear's probably not going to be interested in this guy's chewed up gum, mm -hmm. still, uh, we want to be really cut and dry. If there's any association with people and food, that's really bad. That's yep. the, the, one of the key things we try to avoid here. And it might surprise you how little it takes yeah. uh, to get these bears' attention. They're incredibly sensitive, food-oriented animals with powerful noses. Intelligent, too. Yeah, intelligent as well. Yeah. There's a story that goes around here about uh, a little bit of food scrap, a food waste that was spilled at some point. This is years and years ago on one of the trails uh, that leads down to the beach. And they cleaned it up. They cleaned it up and everything. But there was, you know, just something, some grease or oil or something left in the dirt a little bit. You know, that afternoon a bear walks by, smells it, it's like, oh, food reward maybe. Maybe there's something down there. Maybe I should dig it up. The bear digs a giant massive hole right in the trail. This is where they used to take the carts and everything down to the plains. They had to spend the afternoon filling the hole back in because mm -hmm. they couldn't load the planes because the bear had dug it up. So in that case, the bear didn't end up with a food reward, which is good. But uh, it shows how sensitive they are to even small trace amounts. Right. And that situation could have gone a lot worse. Oh, it could have been. You yeah. know, um, if a bear associates, associates people with food, they might start approaching people for food. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a really bad situation to be in. Right uh, now, things work really well here. We have, there's a lot of stories about bears walking by uh, carts full of food mm -hmm. um, going from a plane or from a boat or coming uh, to the lodge or, or wherever you have a cart of, of lunches or something and, the, and there's been instances where the bears walk by it don't even give it a second look they smell it for sure but they just don't associate those smells with food or with calories because we don't allow them to ever have food rewards from humans mm -hmm. and I think it's imp important to uh, distinguish here that you know, it's not because the bear doesn't get it. It's not like right. he's dumb, like, oh, well, that's probably not food. They can smell what it is, mm -hmm. but they know that it's not going to be a food reward. It's not going to go well if, uh, you know, if they are approaching people for food. Um, if they, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it goes downhill quick when bears start to associate uh people with food. It doesn't go well for the people. It doesn't go well for the bears. And that's something we're going to be talking about a lot as we go through about this, is that these rules aren't just for our safety. Right. This chat is all about bear safety, but a lot of what we have going on here is as much about the bear's safety as it is about human safety. Mm -hmm. It's about keeping these animals wild. I think we'll get into that a lot as we go. Yeah. And so that other thing I mentioned was 
uh, in, in addition to not being able to carry on food, you can't leave any unattended any unattended gear. So you can't set your fishing pole down and walk away. You so can't can set I, uh, your camera. Can bag. I set my phone right here and can't, go do something real can't quick? Can't set your phone right there and go to the bathroom or you know put your bag outside. You got to keep things on you at all times, even be. if they don't have food in them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even if there's not a food reward, they're there's, curious. There's a play reward there. Yeah. You know, bears are, like I said, they're extremely intelligent. And one of the uh, signals of intelligence is curiosity. Yep. You know, the, the kid in class who's always asking questions about things, always wondering, why does it work like that? What? You know, that's a smart kid right there. Yeah, yeah, that's a good the example. same thing goes with bears. Um, if they see something that they're not used to seeing in the wild, they're going to inspect it. And in doing so, they're going to destroy it, number one, mm -hmm. uh, well, the, as one part of that. But also, you don't want to have, you know, your backpack there, and then you see a bear come out of the woods and go, oh, I better get my backpack and approach this bear. Well, right. I, to go it can get put it. you in a dangerous position right. to when all of a sudden a bear is in between you and something you value. Mm -hmm. It's and not a position you want to be in. Right. And we don't need to be in those dangerous positions. Right. There's a simple solution. Right. Keep gear with us at all times. Keep time. it on you. Yeah. So we do that. So you'll find the, that we have to alter our behavior for that. The rangers here, don't we don't leave our, our muddy boots on the porch. Right. We don't uh, keep our bikes leaning up against the building or something. We don't leave things out. Things have to be put away. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah, like we said, they're not gentle investigators. <laughs> it comes from being intelligent, being an omnivore. There's a lot of selective advantage to a bear that checks things out. Right. Looks for food, digs something up, just because, hey, in the wild, maybe that's going to be some extra calories. Right. You never know what kind of food you're going to find. So we have a lot of examples of life jackets and uh, old bags that over the decades we've, that right. we've kept to, as examples of things that bears have investigated and usually torn to shreds. Mm -hmm. And so kind of one, one more thing that uh, maybe not something that we overtly... Uh, address in a, a bear orientation, but one of the really key tenets to uh, us coexisting with these animals is we stay predictable. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have any exceptions to any of these rules. And in addition to that, we're very predictable in where we are. Yep. Right? So we have people around uh, the lodge, we have people around the visitor center, and then we have people on these viewing platforms. And that's it. We have travel in between those, but we don't we don't have a lot of people, you know, wandering through the forest and uh, uh, getting into bears' business where bears aren't used to seeing people. And that's really important. If we stay predictable, if we're just in these key locations, the bears can move around us. They can. They know what they, to expect. They know what to expect. Exactly. They know. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can. I can go catch some fish over here. I won't be bothered. And um, you know, the people are going to stay over there in the buildings and do their thing. Yeah, it's important that we we act. In a, in a regular way, as a group. Of course, individuals will do different things. You can, you can go hike somewhere and check things out. But it, when we're at the, at the falls platforms, for instance, right. it's important that people stay in one platform. This is the reason why we have a platform and not a giant walkway along the whole river for, where people can be scattered everywhere. Right. And the, we ask people not to stop too much on the walkways mm -hmm. that lead to the platforms. And it can be difficult. If there's a bear right underneath the walkway, <laughs> mm -hmm. people want to stop and watch. That's, you can't blame people for wanting to, but you know, we are constantly walking that walkway mm -hmm. and uh, ensuring that people aren't uh, stopping in an area where bears aren't necessarily used to seeing them. So those are all a bunch of examples of how people who visit here, people who live here, uh, mostly willingly, alter, we alter our behavior right. uh, for the sake of bears. And so we started this off uh, with a question to the audience, you know, uh, why should we alter our behavior? We thought we were the top, the top animal, the top, the top of the food chain. So why should we alter our behavior? And that's something that I'd love to read responses to. I'll, I'll open the comments here. Um, but if you're just joining us, uh, I'm Ranger Daniel. And I'm Ranger Dave. Yeah, we're here in, in Katmai National Park on the Alaskan Peninsula. Uh, this big, big remote park, chock full of sockeye salmon and big brown bears. It's really the best place in the world to see both of them. And people. There's a lot of people here, too, if you're here in the right months. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking about how all of those animals live together uh, in relative harmony. Uh, and we're talking about how we make it happen, how it, how it works um, for an hour, and we'll, we'll be answering questions here at the end. Yeah. So, you know, we've talked a bit about uh, some things we do to avoid... Basically, we're doing them to avoid close encounters because we don't want to get too close. We don't want to end up uh, closer than 50 yards to a bear. Right. But 
considering that so many bears are here and so many people are here walking around, inevitably, you know, it could happen. So there's some other things that we do just while we're walking around that aren't necessarily uh, regulations, but they're good behaviors that we can yeah. all do that will avoid those situations or at least reduce those situations. Yeah, David and I were having a little bit of a talk before this. You know, if you follow all of our guidelines and you uh, follow all these rules carefully, do you think you could go, you know, would you, could you avoid a close encounter with a bear? Mm -hmm. You were saying, eh, I don't know, I, th I think you still might encounter a bear at close yeah. range. And that's kind of what we decided was that it's still pretty likely there's a lot of bears here. Yeah. And so knowing what to do when you do encounter a bear at close range is important. Yeah. So some of those things to do to avoid those encounters, um, to really reduce the possibility, especially if you're only here for a short time, if you follow all the, all the guidelines, mm -hmm. you stand a pretty good chance of staying uh, outside of 50 yards of a bear. So one of those things is while you're walking around in a low visibility area, like going to the falls platform, is just make some noise. Make noise and yep. you're, not, you're not really doing that to scare away bears, um, but what you're doing is you're letting bears know that you're there. If you come around the corner and you haven't been making any, no any noise, you might surprise a bear. And a surprise bear is a worse situation than a bear that knows where you're at. It might even get off the trail and you might see it from a distance. Or you might not, if you're, if you're, if you're making plenty of noise uh, walking down the trail and, uh, as, as you come around a corner, there might have been a bear there just a moment before, but if you were making enough noise, the bear uh, may have just wandered off into the woods on its own when it heard you coming. Right. And um, another thing to keep in mind, in addition to, to making noise, is to pay attention to the wind direction. Mm -hmm. um, bears have just incredible noses. There's, a, there's an old saying that says... Uh, a pine needle dropped in the forest, the eagle saw it, the deer heard it, and the bear smelled it. Oh, yeah, that's a great one. So, you know, bears can smell, like, just incredibly well. They, they said that they have uh, seven times better sense of smell than a bloodhound, which is incredible. That's yeah. just, I can't even imagine that. Mm -hmm. But the point is, um, if the wind is blowing at your back, it's likely that the bear can smell you. You have if to the kind of think like a bear a little bit. Right, totally. So if the wind's blowing against you and you're walking uh, straight ahead, the bear's probably not going to smell you because right. the wind's going the other way. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, it's even more important to make some noise so that bear knows when you're coming. So these are, these are all little things when you start to, to tune into these things and just practice thinking like a bear because it's not just the wind direction, maybe a wind intensity. If you're in a forest and the wind's blowing mm -hmm. and the trees are making a lot of noise in the wind, right. uh, or if you're near the river and the water's rushing and making a lot of noise, now the bear might, yeah, the bear might not smell you. Now it might not hear you either. Grass is tall. Now it might not see you. These are things, maybe in that case, if all, all of those things are happening, maybe that's not an area you want to be. <laughs> yeah, you might want to just avoid that area. Yeah. So those are all things you've got you to gotta keep in mind. You've got to be thinking like a bear and thinking, how is this bear going to know I'm coming? Or am I a, if I see a bear soon, am I going to scare it? Am I going to startle it? Right. It doesn't go well for the bear or for the person right. if we startle a bear. And, and just one more thing that I want to cover before we move on uh, as far as uh, uh, avoiding those close encounters, because I think it's something that's really important that, you know, a lot of people, it's just you wouldn't think of it so much uh, just walking around in bear country. If you come across uh, a dead carcass of an oh, animal yeah. or if mm -hmm. you smell uh, some rotting flesh, you smell what you think is uh, a dead animal, time to back up and just get away. Yep. Um, Oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, if you come across a carcass of an animal, something else has been feeding on it. And if you're in bear country, that might be a big old brown bear. You don't want to be competing with a bear for its food right. because that's when, um, you know, the dreadful bear attack can actually happen. Um, yep. I think there's been a lot of studies that show that bear attacks most often happen uh, or at least very often happen when somebody's come across a dead carcass of an okay. animal. Mm -hmm. And not knowing that this was a big old bear's food, and you just came across, and are uh, uh, you know you're now between the bear and its food. Yeah, I like to think of it as these two these two things that you have to keep in mind when you're thinking. You know, what bears do I need to be worried about? You need to be worried about surprising a bear, you know, startling it or scaring mm -hmm. it, and you need to be worried about a defensive bear. Right. So that could be a bear defending uh, a food a food source, or it could be a bear a mother bear defending her cubs. Those are those are the things I keep in mind when right. I'm out and about. Is uh, is I don't want to surprise a bear and I don't want to uh, come too close to a bear that could be defensive. So that means giving extra space to sows with cubs. It means uh, backing up. You know, not going to a, 
big dead carcass that, right. that could be a food source, and it means uh, making sure bears know you're coming. Right. That that's important for all of those. Uh, it's even worse to surprise a defensive bear. <laughs> yeah. So m making sure a bear knows about you before you know about it is a smart move. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you're doing all the right things, right? Mm -hmm. You're making noise, you're aware of your surroundings, but you know what? You might just still end up, you know, you, maybe you come around a corner and a bear wasn't listening for you, and you kind of run, not run smack into a bear, but you well, get you too close to a bear. Yeah. Um, so there's some things that uh, we, we suggest you do, some things that will keep you, uh, you know, keep you relatively safe and make sure that bear tolerates your presence and then so we can continue to go our separate ways and live in coexistence in the same area. Yeah. One of the first things you're going to want to do is, this might seem obvious, but it's important to remember in the heat of the moment, mm -hmm. stay calm. Stay calm, yeah. Don't, don't panic. You know, you, you know your dog can read into your emotions and, and can sense how you're feeling. Bear's going to feed off the, off, the, uh, off the emotions that you're putting out when you first bump into it. Mm -hmm. You bump into a bear and you react with panic and anxiety and, you know, you escalate the situation, the bear's going to escalate too. Yeah. So and it's, it's a good way to help you relax a little bit is to remember that, you know, especially in Brooks Camp, most of the time that people get, uh, you know, too close to bears, they come within 50 yards, it's because a bear is on a trail, it's moving from point A to point B. It's not necessarily on the trail to look for humans to right. eat. It's just getting from one place to another and hey this trail is a lot easier than going through the brush so mm -hmm. the bear is going to use it too. Yeah, We talked about uh, you're walking down the trail and you're making noise and you're, you're uh, with a group or something and you're, you're thinking ah oh, I'll just the bears will just depart the trail before I get there. Bears really like walking on trails. <laughs> they might not. You might come around the corner and the bear might have, have been known you're coming for, for several minutes. It might have smelled you, it might have heard you, so it's not startled by you, but it decided it still wants to walk on the trail right. because the forest is very thick and the trail is nice. Right. So it keeps walking. Yeah. Yeah. So what should you do then? So what should you do then? Besides not panic. Right. Besides not panic, you know, there's no need to yell or wave your arms or try to get big if the bear is just trying to get from point A to point B, which is generally the case. Right. So what to do? Just talk in a calm voice. Hello, Mr. Bear. You look very good today. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. I'm going to step off I'm the trail I'm just going to walk and, away. You know, I'm just going to stay calm. As we walk and off camera. You're going to move on, and I'm going to move on, and we're going to coexist together. Mm -hmm. um, Nine times out of ten, the bear will walk down the trail, and you will get a nice view of it as it goes by. And he'll say, thank you for moving on. I'm mm -hmm. going to move on as well. Mm -hmm. And everyone has a good day. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, talking to calm boys, moving off the trail, you can't always get a full 50 yards away in those situations. But what you can do is just back away slowly. You don't want to necessarily stare the bear in the eye either. One of the key things yep. is, um, you know, you don't want to challenge th the bear. Right. You're going to lose that challenge. <laughs> yeah. The way I like to think about it is you just don't want to escalate the situation. Right. You want to de-escalate it. The bear's huffing, the bear's kind of in, uh, wound up by, by seeing you all of a sudden. You don't want to get up in its face. You don't want to try and, you know, look bigger. Or you, maybe you've heard that, you know, should you wave your arms in the air or yell at the bear? And, uh, for the most time, most part, with brown bears, uh, you want to try and de-escalate the situation. Right. Uh, if, it's, if you have, you know, even, even a moment, then it's enough to try and calm, calm the situation down. Right. And so, you know, we do all these things. Um, you know, all the no food rules, all the good behaviors in bear country, because these animals are extremely powerful. Yeah. You know, they can, they, we stand no match against a big brown bear. Mm -hmm. um, so in order to coexist with them, these are all the things we do. Now, you might be thinking, okay, great, that's Brooks Camp. Um, what about if you want to come here and you want to go camping or you want to go somewhere else in, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in brown bear country and you want to go camping? You can, you can do that in coexistence with bears as well. There's some even more strict regulations that you should probably go ahead and follow as well. So we'll talk a little, about, a little bit about those. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the main things kind of goes along with uh, running into a bear on a trail is when you pick your campsite, um, you want to pick a really good site. You don't want to pick an area that's in uh, the travel lane of a bear. Right, so right. if you're go if you're along a river, if you're uh, somewhere that's open where you might see some matted down grass, 
That might be a bear trail. You probably don't want to put your camp right there. Bears often travel right along rivers or in uh, you know, narrow corridors of uh, relative openness in the forest. So if you can, you want to be in an area where, number one, you're not on a bear trail, but you also want to have good visibility so that as yeah. a bear does come along, if it does, it can see your camp there. And you can see it. And you can see it. Back for, yeah. This is kind of, it goes back to that learning to think like a bear. Right. I think of it that way, that, that just, you got to start getting into the mindset. You're going to set up a camp and say, okay, which way do I think the bears are going to be coming from? Uh, what are they going to be looking for when they're coming here? Are they going to be going down to get water? Are they going to be fishing in that river over there for salmon? Are they going to be going over this pass to go into the next valley? Think about those things. Think about, okay, well, where can I see? Where is the easiest place to travel for the bears and mm -hmm. for me? And then set your camp up according to that. It's going to vary uh, depending on where you're camping. Yeah. And another... Uh uh, another thing with setting up your camp is once you have your camp set up, now there's uh, another thing that you can do that's really going to help you out. It's called the bear triangle. Oh, okay, yeah. All right, so you have your camp in one area, and then 100 yards one way, you have your, your bear canister, or uh, you know, your, your bear-resistant canister where you're storing your food. And then another 100 yards in another way, uh, you're going to have your eating area. So you take your food from your bear canister, walk 100 yards, and then that's where you eat all your food. You never want to eat in your tent. You want never want to eat near your tent. You want to store your food there either. So if you set up this triangle, you know, the bear is not going to have one place to go where you are to investigate all those smells. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it also, it's all about reducing the association between us and calories. Right. And so the triangle shape is so that the bear doesn't just say, oh, this smells like, uh, this smells like food. Oh, this looks, smells like cooked food. And then they go to the tent. <laughs> so you don't want it like food too. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't want it just in a line. Right. So the triangle makes it so that no logical, you know, path of movement would would take them to, uh, to, to more. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So spreading those things out, disassociating yourself and your camp where you're sleeping from where the smells of food are. Mm -hmm. And so the I mentioned the bear resistant container. Oh yeah. And so there's kind of uh, two ways to do that. You know, a lot of people might know you can hang your food, mm -hmm. or you can put it in a bear-resistant bear canister. Both can be effective. However, um, I have found in my personal experience that the bear-resistant container is a much better way to go. It's a little bit bulkier to carry around. Yeah, That's the downfall. But you don't, if, you, if you're in an area where you don't have awesome trees to hang your food from, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. And it's just... Um, you know, even if you hang your food, bears can climb trees. Or you know. squirrels. <laughs> I've had problems with that. So the squirrels will get into your food, you know? Right, sure. It's, uh, you don't want to be feeding that wildlife either. It's maybe not as life-threatening to you, right. but uh, still not good. It's still threatening to the animal. Well, and I guess if they eat all your food, then it yeah, could be life-threatening. <laughs> life you don't want that. Some big squirrels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah, we sometimes call them uh, BRCs. Right. Bear resistant can uh, canisters, those are not uh, unique to here. They have them uh, in bear country all across the country or across the world. Uh, here in Brooks Camp, we uh, loan them out to backpackers for free. Yep. You can you can check out a bear resistant ca canister of various sizes. We should have brought one to show. Yeah. Um, it's basically a plastic, very strong plastic barrel, but it's mm -hmm. a small kind of barrel shape uh, with a lid on top that is difficult to open. It doesn't have obvious screw off or a uh, latch or anything. It has these small little tabs that are difficult to get open. And I think that they probably test these in zoos or something. They right. put a food reward in it and put it in the zoo and see how long or if the bear can get into it. In Actually, the there is only one type of bear that in their testing, uh, from what I've uh, read, that actually got into it as a polar bear. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're called bear-resistant containers. Not bear-proof containers. Because there really is nothing that's bear-proof. Right. Right? They're, they're incredibly strong and incredibly intelligent, so they're bear-resistant. But mm -hmm. it's about as good as you can get. I think the idea is then, too, that if a bear spends half an hour right. playing with this bear-resistant container without a food reward, it's probably going to give right. up and go on to something else. It's kind of like a, like a gated community, right? Like, if you really wanted to get into a, a gated area, you could. You know, you could drive your car through it. You could fiddle with the electronics. You can, but it's a deterrent. Right. You know, people aren't going to spend their time getting through the gate if there's, you know, an open bear canister somewhere else. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Good analogy. <laughs> so, so that's the, camping, right? Yep. So that's and all these things that we're doing when we're camping. You know, if you leave your campsite with some food on the picnic table, you're not going to pay the price. 
but the next person will. Mm. And that's kind of the key about this whole leave no trace thing is, right. you know, it's not going to be a problem for you, but for the next 10 people that come, when the bears learn that, oh, this is an area that's got some food in it, they're going to start, there's going to be some dangerous situations for the next people that come. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess we can, um, let me summarize that by saying that, there's like two ways to think of it when you're camping or just in general when you're in bear country you want to be safe now and for yourself you know mm -hmm. and that's good with the triangle you know and cooking your food uh, away and using a bear uh, resistant container those are those are good things to keep you and the bears safe in the immediate but in the long term leave no trace is a great that's i mean that's the way you got to go to right. to keep the bears uh, from associating people and food in the long run. Mm -hmm. So both of those ideas are really important. Right. Leave no trace and uh, the, the triangle, all that stuff with uh, bear resistant containers. Yeah. And so, you know, we talked a little, about, a little bit about camp. We talked about Brooks Camp and the things we do here. And, you know, like, like we said before, we do all these things so that we can coexist mm -hmm. with these animals. And there's some, there's some sacrifices to be made on our part. There's some adaptions that we have to make. Um, but the, the thing is, if we really want to, there can be more Brooks camps. Oh, if people true. are willing to change their behaviors and maybe even change their lifestyles in some ways, you know, there could be more places like this where we coexist with wild animals. Yeah, that's true. You know, we make these sacrifices here um, because it benefits the bears, and then mm -hmm. in return we benefit from that because we enjoy right. the bears. Um, but yeah, you could imagine other places uh, around the world. In instituting similar practices to to better allow wildlife uh, to to live alongside humans, that that feels like a good point to to maybe find some yep. some comments to read from people. Sure. We at the beginning we asked why should we change our behavior for animals. Um, so I've, we've got a few people have answered. Uh, Margaret uh, said humans need to change behavior in the presence of wildlife because we have the power of reason. Wild animals react by nature. It is programmed into them. Fight or flight. They're programmed to survive for survival, and they'll do what it takes to achieve that. And I guess, you know, so to the contrary, you know, humans, we have the ability to think beyond survival and think about the survival of other animals. Right. That's a good, that's a good I like that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll see if we can find some more as we go along. So do you want to start with some questions? Yeah, I, I've got lots of questions for us here. Okay, um, cool. While you're, while you're looking one up there, I've got one in the chat here, okay. um, and it kind of reminds me of something I wanted to talk about okay. originally anyway. Um, and the question is, do rangers carry any kind of uh, gun or other protection to protect themselves against a bear attack? Oh, okay, great. It's really interesting because, you know, as you might be able to see, we carry bear spray. Um, Pretty much everywhere we go. Yeah. Um, so the rangers all carry these. Um, it can be kind of difficult to get bear spray out to Brooks Camp. That's true. Um, everybody who comes here has to get here basically on a float plane. And in doing that, you don't want to have a bear spray canister in the plane with you because of the elevation change. It could explode. It could leak. And that would be a really bad situation you don't want to be in. So, I mean, sometimes, you know, there's ways to get it out here. Um, but for the most part, it's the rangers with the bear spray. And, yep. Um, I think you're... Well, anyways. Um, so... Should we break that down a little bit? What is bear spray? Do you just spray? Yeah. I just spray this on my clothes, and then they won't. They won't. The bears won't attack me. Not quite. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not not a uh, uh, a bear repellent. You can't spray it around your campsite and expect no bears to come. Actually, if you do that, it'll actually attract bears because once the uh, uh, the really uncomfortable uh, chemicals wear off a little bit, it just becomes another scented. Like, uh, oh, that's I an interesting smell. Yeah, I haven't smelled that before. That. Yeah. It smells like uh, chili peppers. Ooh, there's some, cur <laughs> some curry over here. And it, it could attract bears. Right. But it's really just the same as any uh, pepper spray uh, that you would use for self-defense. Otherwise, just in a bigger can than, than normal and sprays, uh, sprays a little farther. Yep. Um, this is a, something, you know, if you are camping uh, in, you, you're taking, uh, you're hiking in the backcountry, you have bear spray with you. Important to note, shake it up every now and then. Yeah, definitely. This stuff, uh, it can get old. It can it can settle in the bottom. Uh, we recommend that the rangers. I mean, some some people say you know shake it up at least once a week, but some people say every morning before you go out, shake it up like this for Might a little as well. bit. It's not going to hurt. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't take long. Yeah, and one of the uh, kind of comparisons I wanted to make that I'm really glad that somebody asked this question is, you know, why bear spray and not guns? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's some obvious dangers that come along with carrying a gun. Uh, but really, it's not as effective as bear spray. 
uh, there's been uh, uh, a comp compiling of different uh, people uh, have studied attacks. this. Yeah, yeah, and uh, turns out 98% of the time that a bear spray is uh, deployed in defense of a bear, it works. Okay, the person gets away without any serious injury. You talk about using a gun every time that there's a, a, a dangerous bear encounter. It works more like 60, 70 percent of the time, so it's just not as effective. And you might think, well, I don't know about that. I think if I had a shotgun, I'd feel a lot better, or a big old handgun or something. The thing is, bears move fast, man. Yeah. If, they're, if something is coming at you at 40 miles an hour, are you really going to be able to unholster, take the safety off, and hit that thing right between the eyes? I don't think so. And that brings up another point. We don't want to have fatal... Uh, right. uh, defenses against these animals. We're all animals. doing all this for the bears. Right. So if you're, if you're in bear country, it's probably because you mm -hmm. enjoy and respect bears. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, goes back to something we've said multiple times as we've gone along, and that is that we're trying to de-escalate the situation. Right. And what they found is that a lot of times the gun can actually escalate the situation right. by wounding an animal or making a loud noise that really scares it, you know, if you miss or if you uh, shoot it non-fatally. You can, you can dramatically escalate the situation and go from what was maybe a bluff charge at first, right. all of a sudden now is a bear now uh, it's fighting for its life. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, it also just goes back you know, to the main thing we're talking about here. We want to coexist with these animals. We don't want to shoot them. Right. So the, the bear spray, uh, you know, in contrast to a gun, is just an incredibly uncomfortable but temporary right. thing that sprays over an area pretty easy to be accurate with it. Um, pretty quick to use, pretty light to carry, and is unpleasant enough for the bear that the bear just says, I don't want to be in this area anymore. <laughs> this doesn't feel good. And most of the time they run off. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, you ready for a, a question? Let's do it. All right. This is, uh, maybe I should take this question because this is something, but you, we'll see what you think. Okay. So I, I've told a story in the, in the cameras before, on the bear cam before, about a cub coming investigating me. Mm. So let's say, this is what happened to me. I'll, we'll see what you would have done. Right. I was walking on the, on the falls trail with a group of visitors, and a bear is coming up the trail. We say, okay, the bear just wants to walk on the trail, just wants to go by. Mm -hmm. so, so you stepped off the trail? We stepped off the trail. Okay. We got off as far as we could. Uh, we got kind of blocked by some trees. We were maybe 40 yards away or something like okay. that. So we're off the trail in the trees, and the mother bear just walks by. She just wanted to go up to the falls. She didn't care about us. Yep. The cubs, though, they're not so used to seeing people. They're not so sure what's going on. They say, hey. Uh, and so uh, one of them comes up and starts to try and investigate us. Right. And it gets maybe 10 yards away, and it's looking at us. What would you have done in that situation? <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's a tough one. It, it's, uh, every situation is a little different. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe it might depend on who you've got with you. Right. It might depend on you know, exactly what kind of behavior is this cub showing. Is it mm -hmm. just curious? Is it uh, how close is the mother? Uh, are there other cubs around? So, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd probably continue to talk in a calm voice, and, and once things got too uncomfortable, start making a little bit of noise. I wouldn't necessarily want to um, uh, be too aggressive towards the cub. I wouldn't want to get out of here, or, right? You know, because you don't want to make mom mad. Right. That's what we've just been and, saying, right? We don't want to escalate the situation. Right. You want to de-escalate it. Right. But you also want to somehow discourage that cub from investigating you too closely. Right. So what did you do in that situation? I did kind of what you described. You know, we just talked calmly and sternly for a minute, and then I kind of stomped my foot a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. and said, hey, get out of here, but I didn't yell right. or anything like that. I didn't uh, didn't wave my arms or get too dramatic because the mother was close by and she was stressed, and mm -hmm. I didn't want her to feel like her cub was threatened. Right. And so we just kind of waited it out and crossed her fingers, and yeah, sure enough, the cub just wandered off mm -hmm. went about its business I'm curious and I'm sure many other people might be curious did you happen to know which bear that was oh yes I do that was a uh, bear 128 oh, okay but it, I'm sure a lot of people want to know which cub right it was that was investigating me more. and yeah I, I don't know uh, which cub it was yeah we're like totally in the sun that's better okay so the, the Sun yeah all right what well, I've got I've got lots more questions let's lay them on me um, and while you're looking, yes, I am being attacked by mosquitoes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, this is this is sort of a complex question here. Okay. But Brooks Camp has a good safety record. We didn't we haven't really talked about that yet. So maybe you yeah. can talk a little bit about. The, yeah, we do have a good safety record here. We have a lot of bears here, and somehow we've stayed safe. But so, 
why, what is behind that safety record? Yeah, why? it's all the things that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, keep your distance from the bears. Keep your food out of the bears' reach. Uh, you know, keep food in, in hard-sided buildings where they can't get to it. Uh, we haven't had any fatal or really serious in injuries in the history of Brooks Camp um, because we have such strict regulations. Because we make sure people follow those regulations, we are able to uh, uh, create a situation where bears tolerate our presence because we're not a threat to them. We're not. Uh, uh, we don't create situations where um, they become a threat to us. The only thing I would add to that is that um, the bears here are, they're pretty well fed. They're not too stressed. Yeah. They're, they're uh, not really on the, on the hunt always for food. Not saying that bears other places would hunt people, but that they would just be a little bit more stressed out. Whereas mm -hmm. the bears here are generally uh, pretty relaxed because their needs are being met with uh, relative ease. They've got it made in the bear world. Yeah. This is a good place for a bear to live. Yeah. Um, I have a... Some, you know, we asked the question, you know, why should we uh, alter our behavior? Mm -hmm. um, oh, cool. You got another good response there? Well, I've got, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll read part of this one here from uh, Martina. She said, uh, I often think that bears are smarter than some visitors. They, they take care of their interests, and they ignore the visitors as much as possible. <laughs> and I think that's, that's a good point, you know, yeah. that uh, we should remember that we are in in the bear's home this is this is where they are and they're just trying to go about their life and so if we can th learn to think like a bear and just imagine what it's trying to do mm -hmm. every, then we'll be much better at staying out of its way right and staying safe right increase that tolerance and reduce our uh you know mm -hmm. those situations of fear that we have with mm -hmm. them ready for another question yep what do you think of bear bells mm. Well, you know, a lot of people use bear bells, and, um, you know, f for all I know, um, those people are still walking around and making noise and not uh, uh, being attacked by bears. Um, you know, they certainly do make some noise. Uh, in my opinion, I don't think they're quite loud enough to be effective in the areas that you really do want to be making noise. And, you know, for me personally, I would rather just sing a song or talk to my buddy, um, you know, I would be a little annoyed by a constant dingling uh, in my ear. But, you know, that's not to say that uh, it's not a reasonable way to go. My advice, if you're thinking about buying bear bells, would be to... I, I wouldn't think you'd need them necessarily, but I would just start to try and think like a bear. Mm -hmm. Think about where you're walking. Think about where you're going through it. And, and just thinking about what a bear is going to react to what the bear is going to be listening for and how well a bear is going to be able to hear what you're doing. I found that a lot of times I can make more noise by scuffing every other step when I'm walking on the gravel here because our trails are gravel. You scuff that step, it's actually pretty loud yep. and it's a kind of noise that the bears react to uh, pretty quickly. They, they can hear it travels well. Whereas uh, a bear bell it can kind of just blow away in the wind. You, you it's don't not hear very it. loud. Yeah. Is, is my problem with mm -hmm. it really? It's just it just doesn't seem like it'd be loud enough. Mm -hmm. um, said I've I've had other times I've I've pulled my keys out and let them jingle as I walk mm -hmm. just when I felt like I needed a little bit extra noise. Yep. Um, you you just my advice is to th is to try and think like a bear when you're out there and just be trying to think of what that bear is going to be hearing and listening for. Totally. And I think then you'll be able to come up with solutions uh, for for making sure bears can hear you before you hear them. I, you'll, you'll find the solutions as you go along, whether it's clapping or shouting or finding a different trail to walk on. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to come up with the solutions if you start to think like a bear. And that's the key. There's no replacement mm -hmm. for thinking smart and for right. uh, your, your own awareness. A lot of times, carrying bear spray or, or carrying a gun especially, it gives you this false sense of uh, of safety. That's true. Um, and you know the same could go uh, to a lesser extent with bear bells. You yeah. think, okay, I've got this thing making all the noise for me. I don't have to I make any noise. I don't need to pay attention to where right. I am. I don't need to look for bears. Um, you know, there's bear spray. It's not brains in a can. You know, and you can't beat that. <laughs> you just good, cannot. Good mm -hmm. uh, you can't replace your awareness and your your knowledge of the area. Yeah. Um, this person, not a not a bird watcher, has a comment. Uh, says they know that this is a, a snarky remark, but humans should alter their behavior around bears, or the humans will become dinner. <laughs> so th that's that's uh, their response as to why we should we should we change our behavior around bears.
Fair enough. But they should, they all say, you know, that the earn it, we rent it for a short while, and we should leave it better than we found it. So it started with some snark, but ended with uh, a nice a nice thought there. You know, I like that. That that maybe the bears have some right to this place as well. Right. We may think we're at the top of the food chain, but uh, these bears remind us that there's a little bit more going on <laughs> than that. It's a little bit of gray area yeah. at the top there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, should I find you another question? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Um, can visitors travel to the platforms alone? Do you need a ranger escort here? How does moving, like, okay, I'm going to come visit Brooks Camp. Can I just go wherever I want? That sounds dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Are you going to, will you escort me everywhere? How do I do this? Right. So, you know, we don't necessarily have, like, like I said, we've got, uh, you know, we've only got, uh, I, I believe, 13 interpretive rangers on the ground here. So to manage a couple hundred people that come in a day, we can't necessarily walk everybody out uh, mm -hmm. to the falls platform. When rangers do go out to the falls platform, a lot of times they'll stop at the lower platform and let people know that they're heading up there mm -hmm. um, if they want to walk along with them, and the same goes for as they come back from the platform. That being said, there's no regulation that says you, know, you have to uh, be on one of those escorted walks. There's no regulation that says you have to hike in a group, though it is a good idea to group up with people. And, you know, there's generally, especially in our busy months like in July, there's a lot of people walking out of the platform. So if you just maybe wait at the trailhead for some people to come along. Um, you probably won't be waiting long. You probably won't be waiting long. Mm -hmm. And you can, uh, you know, meet up with some people. You might, uh, you know, meet some new friends as you walk along to the, uh, to the falls platform. But, yeah, like you said, there's a... Uh it's it's not unreasonable to think you you shouldn't uh, you know you, you're totally capable and able to walk by yourself down these trails right. and, um, for a variety of reasons. One being that the trails now I think are uh, the bears pretty well associate humans with these trails. Right, people it's one walk of those down places them a lot. that they're used to pe seeing mm -hmm. people. Just like it's uh, it's not necessary to go around clapping and shouting when you're in camp around the around the lodge or around the structures here because yes there could be bears in these areas they are all the time but. Bears know that there's people here. Right. They're used to seeing people in this area, and they're used to seeing people on the trails. They the will not part. be surprised to see a person right outside of the visitor center. Right. Too much. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you, you jump out of the right. door and say, hey, what's up there? <laughs> you always want to be careful <laughs> because uh, just, you know, you can. You, we've all been startled in our own homes before when something you weren't expecting to happen. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, and just along those lines, I see a, a question from just right now. Uh, what about people in wheelchairs? Can they come and see the bears? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah we, we do have some wheelchairs that we can lend out to people. Uh, so, uh, yeah, people who um, don't have full accessibility, uh, full mobility, can still uh, use a wheelchair. We actually got, like, a special wheelchair with these poofy tires that works does, great out here. does much better on the gravel mm -hmm. roads. Yeah, uh, I would say that in general, um, if you use a wheelchair regularly, that Katmai is, or Brooks Camp, is a great place to visit as far as national parks go. Mm. Um, you know, if you want to view bears, uh, a lot of bear viewing is hard. You might need to get into the backcountry. You might want to be climbing mountains. More, you know, not everyone wants to do that. Right. Brooks Camp allows for viewing of bears uh, with a lot less effort than that, and it's really rewarding. Yeah, so. totally. Well, I have some, some more comments that I could read here. Sure. Um, there's there's a few a few good ones here. Um, Posting Real said something, you know, that we should respect all wildlife and that we're encroaching on their land as the population of humans grow and as uh, development continues, um, that we should be keeping keeping animals in mind as we continue to develop. Right. Um, but here is there is another one here um, that Lisa Lisa said this. You know, she said that we should we should alter our behavior around animals uh, for our own safety and for mm -hmm. their protection. Mm -hmm. But that she said, "P.S. W they were here first, and we we're in their house." Yeah. I think that's an important thing to know. That uh, yeah, the bears were here first. Yep. <laughs> we should keep that in mind uh, when we think about who owns this place and. Yeah, and you know, parks are here to protect mm -hmm. those animals and here to protect those natural things that happen. So, mm -hmm. as much as we can reduce our impact on that and live here together with them, uh, that's that's the goal. We want future generations to be able to enjoy right. and and to have these same experiences. Right. Oliver says, uh, a "Fed bear is a dead bear." <laughs> yeah. And someone else said, "Yeah, pretty much the same for all wildlife." So I think that's that's an interesting thing. You want more questions? Yeah, let's do some more questions. All right. Um, 
month. So there's we have some sister national parks or sister park unit national park units mm -hmm. here: uh, Antioch, Jack, Lagnac, Wild River, mm -hmm. uh, the Katmai Preserve. Uh, do visitors to those areas have to check in with the park? Do they have to get a permit? Do they have to you know? Do they go through bear orientation? How does it work to visit those other areas? Because there's definitely bears in those other parks, right? Yeah, there are. Um, you know, we get most of our visitation uh, uh, in Brooks Camp. So that's why we're we're able to, and that's why we do have these really strict regulations where we can give everybody bear training um, because it's this one condensed area where we get so many people in. So it makes a lot of sense to do that. There's just It's just not possible to have people everywhere in the backcountry giving uh, bear orientations. Yeah. There are uh, a few locations on the coast, uh, Hallow Bay and Amalek Bay, where there are backcountry rangers stationed there. There's not a mandatory uh, um, a bear orientation because how can you control there's not one small place where everybody flies their plane and yeah. they can land their plane anywhere. Um, but there are some rangers out there that can contact people and educate them about bear behavior and about uh, you know what it's going to be like with the bears there. And, teach them maybe how to coexist with those yeah. bears. I think that, you know, if you're planning a trip to one of those areas, uh, what you should maybe consider doing is watching this live chat, which if you're listening to this, then you are watching this live chat now. So, <laughs> so you're job. on the right track. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, here's another one. Um, this person says that they hike, uh, says, I hike in northern Idaho where there are grizzlies. Mm -hmm. uh, if a grizzly attacks, should I play dead? We haven't really talked about playing dead much, right. have we? Yeah, um, and you know, so before we answer that question, I think it's uh, really important to just, um, you know, we've we've kind of alluded to this already, but uh, we're talking about Katmai brown bears right now. Yeah, brown bears. Uh, um, excuse me, brown, brown <laughs> bear populations are all different. Yeah, you know, whether it's a different population of brown bears, whether it's grizzly bears or black bears, mm -hmm. all different stuff. So. Um, the information that we're giving right now, the suggestion, suggestions on behavior and uh, attitudes, that kind of stuff, it applies to these brown bears. Um, if you're going out to another area, you should definitely talk to like the local authorities of that area and get like the specific uh, uh, guidelines of what they suggest you yeah. do with those bears. And any of that's not an excuse for not not thinking, right? Like we like we've been talking about this whole time, right? That learning to think, you know defensively, learning to think like a bear, those are things that are going to help you, sure. whether you're here or in northern Idaho or wherever. You have to be cautious and critical in the way you approach your behavior outside. Sure. In brown bear habitat. Right. It's, it's a smart idea. Yeah. But uh, to answer the question, um, what to do in a, a bear attack. Mm -hmm. So there's two types of bear attacks. There's predatory attacks and defensive attacks. Mm -hmm. Predatory attacks in uh, grizzly bears especially, very, very rare. Yeah, it, almost none. Almost, it does happen, um, but extremely rare. Mm -hmm. And so what we mean by that is a pred pred predatory attack, that bear is preying on humans. For food. For food. It's viewing us, ourselves, as a food source. Again, very rare, but it has happened in the past. Mm -hmm. So in that case, if you think a bear is preying on you, if it attacks you and it continues to like maybe feed on you or maybe when it's before it's attacked it's been stalking you it's been showing signs that you know this is not a defensive animal it's not upset that you're too close to it it's been following me and it's showing a lot of interest in eating me uh, and then if it does attack if it makes contact and it continues uh, to attack you for you know uh, a long time after you've been playing dead that bear is trying to eat you you need to fight back uh, for your life. Mm -hmm. Any any means necessary, you need to fight back for your life. What happens, well, the, the more uh, frequent cause of a bear attack is a defensive attack. Right. You've stumbled too close to a bear's cubs, you've uh, stumbled onto maybe a, a carcass of an animal that it was feeding on. Um, you've surprised a bear and it's it's reacted defensively and it's charged you and it's made contact. In that case, you're absolutely right, play dead. Mm -hmm. um, don't make any noise. Cover up your neck, your vital organs. Try to remain on your stomach. And if the bear rolls you, roll right back onto your stomach. And uh, again, just play dead. Don't make any noise. Pretend uh, that you're dead, that you're not going to be a threat to the bear. And hopefully it will leave you alone. Let's say, too, that uh, we haven't had either kinds of attack, predatory or defensive, in Brooks Camp. Right. Ever. Good point. People have been coming here. 
uh, in pretty good numbers for a long time, and there's a lot of bears here. And for the most part, everyone follows the rules. They follow the guidelines. We haven't had any problems. Yeah. Uh, we have had one predatory bear attack, one bear attack t total, in mm -hmm. or one instance in Katmai, uh, sort of a famous instance. There's a whole film about it and everything. That's the, uh, the Timothy Treadwell, whole, that whole story. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need to dive into that. But um, for the most part, here in Brooks Camp, there haven't been issues, predatory or defensive, you know, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. We have because, a pretty good safety record. Because we follow those rules so strictly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, you ready for another question? Yeah. Hopefully a little lighter note of a question, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'll let you be maybe. a judge. Uh, do many children visit Brooks Camp, and do bears show interest in chasing running kids? I think there's there's some things uh, maybe in the in the park safety film about uh, not allowing children to run. We have kind of a guideline around right. camp that people shouldn't be running through camp, in those areas, uh, things like that. And we always say that if you encounter a bear at close range, you should not run. Don't run away, yeah. So let's break that down why shouldn't you run around bears okay yeah, yeah. so um, yeah that's one thing that uh, uh, as I was going through the do not think do not do things I uh, didn't mention don't run from a bear if you see one mm -hmm. that might trigger a predatory response in the bear it might say oh what's that running away it looks like something I can eat maybe it's like a small deer or something or just hey wait a minute I was looking at that let me go right take a look at it I was not done investigating yeah. that thing so um, if you run away from a bear, there's a chance that it may chase you. It may uh, uh, be more interested in investigating you. It may uh, associate you running away as some kind of food source. So you don't want to run away from a bear. Now, back to the question, first of all, do children visit Brooks Camp? Yes, we, we do see children here. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily a place that we um, uh, would advertise as a place that you want to bring your children to for obvious reasons um, you know brown bears can be pretty dangerous that being said there's no regulation that says you can't bring your kids here anyone's more than welcome to bring their children if they uh, feel comfortable doing so um, and if as long as we all follow the rules and we all uh, uh, adhere to the right behaviors that can be a safe thing to do so most people who bring their children here just keep their children with them at all times right hold their hand carry them that kind of thing and I've seen some kids have a really good time. Yeah, it can be very rewarding. The viewing the bears uh, on any of our platforms and everything is a pretty good activity for. I mean, kids kids love it. Yeah, if you want to get who your, doesn't love yeah, it really. I mean, yeah. <laughs> if you want to get your kids interested in nature, uh, seeing the largest land predator is probably a good way to get them excited about it. Yeah, that's true. Ready for? Here's a comment. Cool. Uh, so why should we alter our behavior for animals? Lolo says, we may be at the top of the food chain, but we must adapt to coexist with all creatures on Earth. All contribute in some way, and all are entitled to share this land with us. I think that's really nice. I like it. Yeah. I got some more. Uh, this person says, um, you know, because it's not, it's, it's not just our, ours, but it's their environment. And because if we don't adjust our behavior, we endanger the bears as well as ourselves. Yeah. So this is, I mean, it sounds like we are all in agreement on this. <laughs> yeah. Everyone seems to, to have the, the same idea as we do, and that's really great to hear. Yeah. All right, well, let me find a question now. Cool. Um, okay, here's, a, here's maybe a fun question. Screaming. What are your feelings on screaming? <laughs> what are my feelings on screaming? Please don't do it in my ear. Please don't be like Otis and scream into my ear if uh, I do something that bothers you. Um, but in regards to warding bears away. Yeah, I think, well, no, no, no. I think the idea was that the person was imagining that if they were walking down the trail and they, they bumped into a bear. Okay. They, they know not to run away. They, they know to talk calmly or something. But that just out of excitement slash fear, right. they might scream. Right. So the problem with that is... Uh, a bear might interpret that as a threat. We it kind of talked about this, right? The, the escalating versus right. de-escalating. Right. A scream, I would say, is an escalation <laughs> of the situation. I would say that's safe to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, the bear might interpret that as a challenge to it, and mm -hmm. it may react accordingly. It may continue to escalate the situation. Not, it's not to say necessarily that um, that's definitely going to happen. It, the bear might go, oh, I don't really want to mess with that guy. But it's much safer. It's a much better bet to just back off the trail, talk in a calm voice, de-escalate that situation, yep. let the bear be on its way, and you know you can go continue on with your day as well. 
So here's another good question. Um, some people are asking about bear behavior, mm -hmm. bear body language, mm. bear vocalizations. Great things to talk about. So you're watching a bear. How do you know what the, how that bear is reacting to you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there's some so some things you can look out for. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a almost like a bear language, right? Yeah. You read its body behavior, you uh, uh It's a language you can you can try and become more fluent in and it's good to, to dabble in it a little, but we'll never probably crack the code completely. Right, right. So um there's a few things. One of those things, uh jaw popping. That's a big one uh -huh. that we'd like to talk about. Uh it's a really interesting uh behavior that the bears do when they're stressed out, uh where they where they feel challenged. Uh, or when they're just uncomfortable because of something we're doing or something another bear is doing. And uh, what it is, they're, they're making this clacking noise with their teeth where they're... It's really hard to impersonate, but it sounds like this popping noise. It's kind of a scary sound. It is, yeah. And you can see, you know, their, their jaws opening and closing, and they're making this popping noise. So we call that jaw popping. I, I bet if you search for it in the Internet, you can yeah, find I'm a, sure bear, you could a, find a it. video clip of that. Um, some other things, uh, y you know... Uh, uh, Cowboy walking, that's something you might see a really dominant bear doing, a bear that's uh, wanting to show that um, it's the biggest, baddest creature around, you better not mess with it. Well, that's kind of like an exaggerated swagger, you know, they'll kind of, I'm big and bad and you shouldn't come near me. Mm -hmm. That's another thing you can look out for. What are some other ones? Did you talk about yawning? Yawning, great. Yeah, so yawning, uh, I was, you know, that's kind of a surprising one to learn. Right. You know, but bears because bears do yawn when they're tired mm -hmm. uh, like we all do um but sometimes it's it's obvious when you'll see other bears a more dominant bear walk by another bear or you'll see a sow with cubs getting uh, uh another bear getting too close to her cubs you'll see this this yawning it's a sign of stress mm -hmm. i think maybe dogs sometimes yawn mm -hmm. when they're stressed as well mm -hmm. um just a sign of stress the way i like to think about this though is you're watching a bear and you're like you're and you're looking at it and you're wondering how is that bear reacting to me? What does it think of me being here right now? Is it stressed out or is it cool? I can almost promise you that the bear is not happy that you're there. <laughs> it might yeah. feel indifferent, right. um, or it might feel mad that you're there, or or scared or stressed that you're there, but. It's hard for me to imagine that a bear is excited <laughs> to see a person at any time. <laughs> and and might, if it is yeah. excited to see a person, it's probably bad. Yeah. <laughs> so you can, in general, uh, know that uh, bears should be allowed to do their own thing. That's right. really what all these rules are about. The, the, our rules and regulations and behavior adaptations are in order that the bear shouldn't have to feel anything about us. Right. We want the bears to be wild and not considering us. Right. We can't do that all the time. We, we encounter the bears... Uh, you know, here in camp or at closer than 50 yards sometimes, and they do react to us. But the goal is to try and keep these animals wild and to keep them from reacting to mm -hmm. us. And those, you know, those reactions are great to read because they can tell you what you should be doing. Yeah. Right? Um, growling, of course, is another one. But oh, yeah. one that I can impersonate, that I'm willing to impersonate, is huffing. Oh, okay, yeah. It's a lot like a growl. Um, if you see a bear huffing, it's not having breathing problems. Uh, it's stressed out, uh, mm -hmm. probably about your presence. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a <laughs> <laughs> something like that. <laughs> You'll see the mother bears do this a lot yeah. with their cubs. Yeah, they'll they'll huff and it almost seems like they're talking to their to their cubs sometimes. Yeah, we saw this this morning. They'll uh, huff at their yeah. cubs and send them up a tree, maybe. Yeah, when or, there's a dangerous or sometimes situation. they'll huff and the cubs will come running to the mother. Right, mm -hmm. right. So we can we can do our best to kind of look at these behaviors and and react accordingly, saying, okay, those are signs of stress. I don't know exactly what they mean, right? But it for me means back let's, up. Let's get out of here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, give the bear uh, some more space. So there are no bear whisperers. Uh, we don't speak the bear's language, but we can uh, uh, guide our behavior based on some of the things that they show us. Right. Uh, to say one more time, I guess, then, yeah, it's because if the bear seems like it's trying to communicate something to you, the message is probably go away. Get away from it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think true. they're trying to communicate other things to us. Very true. Haven't seen that yet. Yeah. So, great question. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, can bears smell fear or sense anxiety from humans? We talked about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, we can't necessarily ask the bear if it knows what we're feeling or thinking, mm -hmm. but it seems that they would. Um, you know, other animals are able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, people are able to do that with other people. You yeah. can, uh, and we can do that with bears too. So it, it it only makes sense that if 
uh, uh, if we're stressed out, if we're kind of freaked out, the bear probably knows we're a little freaked out. Mm -hmm. If the bear is freaked out, we get a pretty good idea that the bear is freaked out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so some more people, we've thrown a few different terms around here. Some people are talking about bear school mm -hmm. and uh, bear orientation. Maybe we should talk about what are the differences between that. I can explain that even. Yeah. Um, yeah, so bear school is sort of what we call the bear orientation. It, sometimes it's called a bear safety school, bear safety orientation. It's all the same thing. It's when, when you come visit Brooks Camp, you go into the visitor center first thing before you before you go to the lodge before you go to the bathroom before you do these other things we will let you go to the bathroom real quick <laughs> but it's the first thing you do um, you go into the visitor center and you watch the bear safety school video uh, it's a 10 minute video and then a ranger comes in and walks us through some more points right. that were in the video you know and breaks it down a little bit more and answers questions talks and, about Brooks camp specific things yeah. as well yeah more specific. so that's what bear school is so sadly it's not something that you can uh, do online at this point right. it's it's an in person only uh, bear school and so everyone who comes here goes through it and everyone who goes through it gets a bear safety or a bear school pin and right. This year we have a centennial edition pin. It has a big 100 because in case you didn't know, this is the birthday of the National Park Service. Park Service is 100 years old this year. So we have a different pin every year, uh, a new edition. So a lot of people collect them. Uh, I think your cabin has a pretty big collection, right? Yeah, I've right? got about 15. These go back more than a decade. Yep. And so the, they have a little design. They're a little commemorative pin that you can then wear. And they prove to the rangers that this person went through bear school. Um, and so because we have one for every year, it's not a one-time deal. You don't right. get one bear orientation and you're done. Every single year, it doesn't matter if you've been coming here since 1990, every year you come here, you have to go through bear orientation just to, you know, brush up on the regulations and Yeah, because uh, things behaviors. do change. Yep. And, I mean, really, having reminders is, is not a bad thing. And so it's kind of an incentive that uh, every year you come back, you can get the new pin and, and continue collecting them. And some of them are pretty cool. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, have you found any found any more questions on there? Um, I can I can go back and look for some. Okay, um, I've got a fun one though. Okay. Um, why don't the bears try and eat the birds? <laughs> I, you know, we we, get we that watch the cameras. Lot. You know, you watch the camera and you're gonna see probably three animals. You're gonna see bears, seagulls, and fish. You never know what you're gonna see. You might see something more than that. That's true. We have eagles, wolves, moose. There's but all kinds of things. You can pretty much guarantee. <laughs> right. You're gonna see those animals. Yeah. So. Why don't the bears eat eat the birds? I think that uh, it wouldn't be that hard to find a bear who is willing to eat a bird. But when you have big, juicy, delicious salmon straight from the ocean served up at your feet every day, uh, or 15, 40, 40 or more times a day, uh, what would you choose? You know, uh, right. a, a little uh, glaucous wing gull or, or the big salmon. You know, uh, people love salmon. <laughs> Bears love it too. Um, but I don't know of any people that eat seagulls really. Um, so it's not that the bears wouldn't eat the seagulls. It's that they have so much salmon that they don't really have any need to eat the seagulls. And um, the seagulls are, can fly. They're a little bit harder to catch. Harder to catch them, not as big of a reward. Uh, not as many calories, yeah. So, to the bears, it just doesn't make a whole lot of Yes, you can't right, say that they definitely won't eat it, but if there's a, a school, uh, you know, if there's a couple of trout that swim by and there's a salmon, they're going to pick out that salmon. It's got more calories, It's uh, it's got more fat in it, and the bear's going to prefer that over any other fish. Right. Bears are super food oriented. I mean, we, in Yellowstone, sure, you're going to have bears. They'll they'll eat spawning cutthroat trout. Um, they'll they'll eat berries there and stuff here, and they'll eat berries here. But these bears are going to the best food source for the time. So you'll see this year, especially, we have a lot of bears just stay at the river all through August because the fish were pretty good. A lot of years, the bears will leave, go find berries. They'll go on to the next best food source. Right. But if there's fish... They're probably going to stick with those with the fish, especially the salmon. Right. Mm -hmm. 
So I've got a question here about um, law enforcement. Are there oh, okay. law enforcement rangers? Do we give out tickets? Mm -hmm. How does that all work? Maybe you can explain that. For people. Yeah, so there are law enforcement rangers here in Brooks Camp. Mm -hmm. All national parks have uh, law enforcement rangers. They uh, look pretty similar. They have a little bigger badge. They often have, you know, the big utility belt, um, that kind of thing. They're different than rangers like me. Uh, Regular park rangers do not have the authority to write tickets or right. enforce the law. Right. But there are rangers dressed in green and gray that do have the authority to enforce uh, federal laws. They're police officers, basically, right. uh, federal police officers. And so we have that out here. There's uh, We have uh, law enforcement rangers that enforce all kinds of laws. A lot of it is uh, fishing laws that they're enforcing. But sure, if people are getting too close to bears, if people are harassing the bear or something like that or feeding a bear they would uh they would inf enforce uh, the law against those people uh we don't have much problem people out here are pretty we have great visitors here right. yeah. yeah yeah and that you know that goes back and a, a, a lot of it goes back to the the training we do you know mm -hmm. we make sure everybody has this uh goes has this experience where they learn about what it's going to be like and what they need to be doing before they go out mm -hmm. and uh, walk among the bears yeah. Uh, want another question? Yeah, let's do a couple more. There's there's a lot of good ones on here. This person said, what is the biggest mistake I could make uh, in terms of bear encounters uh, when they're visiting here? Well, that's, I mean... It's a little bit of a personal you know, yeah, opinion. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, there's certainly a lot of things you could do wrong. Um, I think it, it's, the th boring answer is you could, the, the, the worst thing you could do is escalate the situation. Right. Specifically, what does that mean, though? Yeah. I, you know, I think, um, speaking from what I've read about uh, uh, bear encounters, and if you want to read about bear encounters, a really good book on this stuff is uh, uh, Bear Attacks, or Causes, and Avoidance by uh, Stephen Herrero. It mm -hmm. goes through yeah. um, almost every bear attack that's ever happened, mm -hmm. and it breaks down, you know, what was the situation? Why did this occur? How could it have been? How could it have been avoided? So, mm -hmm. if you want, you know, more info on that kind of stuff, that's a great thing to read. That's a great way to get information on what are some of the worst things um, you could do, or what some of the worst things that could happen with uh, in in regards to bear attacks. From what I've read from that, it seems like one of the worst things you can do is come up on an animal carcass and start inspecting it and mm. not be paying attention to what's going on around you. Yeah. Um, you know, that's I guess that's not really the answer to the question because they want to know what's the worst thing you can do in an encounter once you're already in one. Um, but uh, that's one thing that I, uh, kind of a red flag that goes up in my head is, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to mess with any animal carcasses out in bear country. You know, another thing you don't want to do, uh, you know, there's a variety of things we've talked about them already. You don't want to run away from a bear. Uh, you don't really want to challenge the bear. Like you said, you don't want to escalate the situation. So uh, what it goes back to is what, what are the things you want to do right? You want to de-escalate the situation. Mm -hmm. You want to back away slowly, talk to the bear in a calm voice, and you want to try to avoid those situations to begin with. Um, you know, don't carry food on you. We've covered all this yeah. uh, in the last hour. Um, so as we're wrapping up here, uh, do you want? I, some people were asking some more about bear spray. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, they want to see how fast one we could draw our bear spray. <laughs> no, about that. Which is kind of a fun <laughs> idea. And then too, they just kind of want to uh, talk a little bit more of how it works and take a closer look at it. Okay. Um, that is something that we do, uh, and we encourage the rangers here to do. And and I would encourage that if you regularly go hiking or backpacking in bear country, uh, when you're hiking with your bear spray, don't put it in the bottom of your pack. Be useless if it's in the bottom of your pack. <laughs> Why even carry it? Yeah. Um, don't even carry it on the top of your pack or in your pack. It's just not useful. It needs to be on your waist. Uh, Maybe on your, on your chest uh, on your or your chest, shoulder strap. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere where you can absolutely yeah. grab it right away. And another thing that um, I really um, am a big fan of that I've started doing since moving out here, um, anytime I see a bear and I feel even a little bit uncomfortable about oh, yeah. how close I am, just unstrap it and take it out. Just hold it in your it hand. In your hand. So you're ready. Um, so you're ready to go as soon as it, um, as soon as anything could go wrong. I guess we could say that too. That neither of us have sprayed bear spray out here. Right. Uh, we've sprayed uh, tests and we've we've practiced with it, but mm -hmm. but uh, because we, for the most part, follow all these guidelines and rules, I haven't felt the need to spray it yet. Right. Been a few close calls where I've had it out I've and I've taken the safety off. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but haven't had to haven't had to spray it. Yeah. And.
Um, that should be the case for most anyone who visits here and follows mm -hmm. follows our guidelines. Do right. you want to see how fast we can drive? Um, the thing that I'm nervous about doing that is uh, people have accidentally sprayed it on themselves. Okay, you're thinking not take the safety. Oh off. no, no, Excellent. I'm not going to take the safety. I don't want to do that because if I spray myself bear spray on live uh, on the live feed, uh, I would yeah. never forgive myself. I don't myself. think. I, yeah, I wouldn't sign up for just a, a draw between the two of us. <laughs> see who could spray each other. Uh, brings up a good point that in a lot of times, you know, when you're thinking about should I buy bear spray, should I carry bear spray, think about if you're willing to practice with these things. Think about if you're willing to carry it on here because a lot of times the bear spray can be just as much of a hazard uh, to you if you're if you're not prepared to use it right or, or treat it with respect because uh, I've heard a lot more stories of people accidentally spraying themselves or their friends with bear spray right. than I've heard stories about people defending themselves with right. bear spray. And by far, a lot of people, a lot of people I know, have accidentally sprayed themselves, and right. uh, it's not been a fun afternoon. Yeah, and um, you know, we we mentioned this earlier, but it's not going to cause any long-term injury. Right. It's going to be really uncomfortable, yeah. probably pretty painful. Um, but again, you're not going to go blind for the rest of your life. You probably won't be able to see for the next, you know, I don't know, couple hours. Couple hours. You're mm -hmm. not going to be able to see very well. But uh, uh, what's great about it is nobody's going to die. You know, nobody's going to lose their ability to see. And yeah. while I don't want to accidentally spray myself, I feel way more comfortable carrying this around than a gun um, for, for all the reasons we've already talked about. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. All right. Ready? So you just like back like you're like not even okay. Okay. And Oh, there's a bear. You are a lot faster. faster. <laughs> <laughs> so... We've we've talked a lot about the 50 yard rule. We've talked about how fast bears can move. If a bear is 50 yards away from you, it can reach you in three seconds. So you better be pretty quick with the bear spray. You better be more importantly, you better be paying attention to what that bear is doing. You better be paying attention to the, your surroundings because that's what's going to save you. It's not going to be the super quick draw. That's right. You're gonna you're gonna what's going to save you is knowing what the situation is. Preventing the encounter from happening right. uh, to begin with. Right. So we've been uh, we've been talking at you for about an hour and a half now, so we're going to let you go back to watching what you turned this thing on to watch is the bears. Yeah. Um, if, you just, if you're just joining us here at the end, you've been just catching the end of this, we'll say that I, I'm, I'm Ranger Daniel. And I'm Ranger Dave. We're here in Katmai National Park, big remote national park here in Alaska. We've been talking about bears and salmon and stuff, and we do this pretty regularly. We, we hop on the cameras, we answer questions, uh, and we talk about uh, what's going on here in the park. And you can you can watch this anytime. You're maybe watching it on Facebook Live right now, but you can watch it at explore.org all the time. We have cameras with bears, and we have a camera up on the mountain. There's a camera under the water in the river. Definitely something to go check out, explore.org. And we'll have rangers jumping on it every now and then to answer questions and stuff. So yeah. thanks for joining us today. Thanks for hanging out. We'll, uh, we'll get back on here soon, and we'll, we'll see you then. All right.